Spokane, Washington was once declared the healthiest city in the United States because of an angel that brought healing. Next, on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet, the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter an angel that helped spread healing so that a city was actually named the healthiest city in the United States. I have Cal and Michelle Pierce here. And Cal, tell me about what happened in uh, this particular city. Well, John Lake came to Spokane in, in 1915. And from 1915 to 1920, he put together a team of men and women that he called healing technicians that prayed for the sick in the city of Spokane. And in that five-year period, there were 100,000 documented healings in the city. What happened with the hospitals? Well, the, the hospitals weren't real excited about this because <laughs> uh, the sick decided that it was better to go let Jesus do the work in their body rather than go to the hospital and, and receive surgery and a bill. Mm. No, no question, but I want to find out something about you because I know that that same angel that released all those miracles accompanies you now. So I'd like to find out about the two of you. Uh, Cal, you, you uh, had a son, David, a yes. uh, very special son. And Michelle, tell me about David. Well, David was born uh, with uh, muscular dystrophy and um, when he was about 16, he, he was always a, a Christian, but when he was about 16, he just got on fire for God. What caused that? I don't know. Um, he, he'd been reading his word, but all of a sudden he just wanted to read it more and more. He was like reading 10 chapters a day and, uh, and then praying. He just sought God and um, he loved the Lord and he, I, we believe he was an intercessor for God because he would just pray. Was there any one specific thing you can think of he prayed for? Well, uh, towards the end, um, he was uh, really deep in prayer. And one time, um, Cal came and asked him, you know, specifically what he was praying for. And he got tears in his eyes. And he said he was praying for Russia, uh, that they were studying in, in school. And he, um, so he was praying for the communists um, to um, lose their power to you know to fall well they did how much they did. how and much before that did he pray it was uh, it was like a month or two later that the uh, wow. Berlin wall talk about out. an instant answer to prayer yes it uh, it got our attention <laughs> uh, Cal there was one time you caught your son weeping tell me about that well he was he was in the hallway and uh, he was crying and Michelle come up uh, Michelle and I went up to him and said David why are you crying and he said because I had a bad thought and you know that just crushed me because I thought of all the bad thoughts that I had had that never bothered me but yet this young man was so pressing into God a young man that could only move his head and his hands but yet he was so hungry for the Lord that he would uh, spend all of his time just seeking God and, and praying and and he was a prayer warrior you know my wife and I were sort of what you might say stuck into this religious spirit where we weren't really pressing into God. We were watching television and things like that and not really serving. Oh, but wait a second now. Mm -hmm. uh, in Redding, California, yes. you were an elder yes. in, in a fine church. Yes. And one day they got a new pastor yes. and something amazing happened to you. Tell me about that. Well, that was in January of uh, 1996. And uh, uh, I was at the point where, you know, I was, like you say, an elder, a board member. I tell people now I was probably the most bored board member the church <laughs> had. And uh, I would only be there on Sunday morning because uh, I wasn't studying as I should be. I wasn't praying, pressing in. And uh, we got this new pastor. His name is Bill Johnson at Bethel Church. And he, and he was crying out for revival. And things were starting to happen around the church, around the city where he was having meetings. And uh, I told my wife, I said, honey, those are the meetings we're not going to because I didn't want to go where things were happening. 
you know, I was in a dry and thirsty land. But then Bill had a meeting that he sent a letter out to all the leadership and uh, uh, he sent a letter to us and Michelle brought it to me because it said on there that, that you're required to go if you're in leadership. So I kind of relented and it was in what we call the upper room behind the sanctuary and there was about a hundred people there. And uh, uh, we sung four or five praise and worship songs. We were standing, and the next thing I knew, we'd finished singing, and Bill just simply raised his hands and said, "Come, Holy Spirit," and that was the last thing I remember. It was, it was like the lights had gone out. I don't know what that meeting was about for everyone else, but I knew about the meeting that I had. It literally ignited my heart and soul. It was well, way... Did someone touch you? Did someone pray no. for you? No, we were just standing there and... We? I mean, did this Michelle, happen to you too? Yes, I, I ended up on the floor. He stood. You know, it was <laughs> as if I was glued to the floor. I wanted to run, jump, shout. It was just wave after wave of God's anointing coursing through my body and it literally set a fire in me that would not go out. It, it just ignited my very heart and soul. And that's what began a call in my life. Before it was my life, after that it was my life given to God. It was every all I could do is serve Him. I didn't. I no longer wanted my program. Now, when you looked at your son David, you probably wondered how could he even be like that? Well, maybe because he's paralyzed, that's why he's that way. But I guess you never thought in your wildest imagination you could be that way. No, because, you know, when, when we were, when I was going by David's door, night after night, we'd been watching t TV, I'd hear him in there crying out to God. And my cry was, God, how can I know you like David? I said, God, I want to have a heart for you like my son. You know, and then when this happened, it was like, it was like God just poured into me that heart of David. I began to have a passion and a thirst, and, and I could not sit still. I, in that year and a half that, that this happened, after this happened, I probably read more about revival and about healing than, than I did in my entire life, including college. You know, so, I, so, so you read, read books especially yes. about famous men of God, and one particular attracted you, John G. Lake, yes. who had 100,000 miracles yes. in Spokane, had a particular place, and he was buried there yes. in a healing room. Uh, and uh, why did you decide to relocate there? Well, you know, during this year and a half, I felt stirred. We grew up in, in Reading. We were going to retire and do our thing there, but after a year and a half of, of this fire that came into my life, I finally told my, my wife, I said, honey, I got to go north. I, I did not even think about John Lake at this time. I just, there was a stirring in me to go north. I finally told her, honey, I'm going to go for three days. She said, where are you going? I said, well, up to Spokane, Coeur d'Alene. My folks had been there visiting one time, told me about it. That was the only connection. And I was teaching a class on healing before I left, and I told the class I wouldn't be there the following Sunday. And someone said, who had John Lake's, uh, the book that the Copelands wrote about John Lake, and they mentioned, hey, that's where John Lake was from. And I thought, that's right. And that changed both of you. I mean, your lives have never been the same. We'll be right back after this word. YouTube Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word. It means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe. Then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter, and I'm here with Cal and Michelle Pierce. And something happened in their life so supernatural. Cal started reading a book on the life of John G. Lake, who had over 100,000 documented miracles in Spokane, Washington. And Cal, so you told your wife one day, we're moving to Spokane. How did you uh, take that? Well, 
I, I knew it was, it was all right. I mean, it was a difficult move. I'd lived my whole life in Reading, but um, I knew it was time, and so I just transferred and with my job, and um, and we moved up there. Now, now you prayed for over a year at the grave site of John G. Lake. Why, why, yes. why did you do that? What was your motivation? I just felt drawn there. It, it, it just, uh, there was just something in me that, that because of the burden for healing and this man who, who knew how to touch the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and, and I just went there to, to seek God. It wasn't about John Lake, it was about Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the anointing. I wanted to see that fire, that power once again poured out because I knew God hasn't changed. He's still how, the same. How did you get the idea then from praying all that time and fasting all that time to reopen the healing room that John G. Lake had? Well, after praying for a year and three months and uh, pressing in, heaven seemed to be brass at times, and the Holy Spirit prompted me to fast for 40 days. And when I did that, uh, the Holy Spirit said, you know, there's a time to pray and there's a time to move, and this is the time to move. He said, if you want to walk on the water, you got to get out of the boat. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So we called together intercessors and had a day of intercessory prayer, and that uh, began to uh, start the whole work. Well, how did you even find that room and uh, those healing rooms that John G. Lake had, and, and, and how did you get possession of it even? Well, well, I had gone there and uh, I'd visited the different sites around the city when we first moved there that Lake had had, where his house was and, and where the rookery building was, and I'd walked the hallway there praying. It's an old building, uh, not many tenants on that third floor, and when I walked the hallway, the enemy come along in the beginning and said, you know, you're no John G. Lake, what are you doing here? So, so I went back to the gravesite and prayed some more. But this was a year later when I was fasting, when the Holy Spirit said, drew me to redig the well of healing. He said, if you want to dig a well, you got to go back to the well site. You got to do it there. So he said, go back. So a year later, I'm walking the, the hallway again on the third floor praying. And the Holy Spirit come along beside me and said, you know, it wasn't John Lake. It was me and I'm still here. And I knew then we had to open these rooms. How so, did you know about that angel? Well, you know, we had the intercessors there and they were, they were being prayed for because I know intercessory prayer was an important part, important part of this ministry. And I was anointing people. And when they went into the silver room, when I was anointing them in this room that has silver carpet, uh, everyone was on the floor. But outside the room, everyone was standing. And a lady sent me a note saying, I want to tell you what happened. When I entered that room, the power of God was so powerful that no one could stand in that room. You know, so... When I came to start moving in, I said, I got to check this out. I, I was bringing some boxes. So I walked through the doorway into this room with a silver carpet. And I felt the presence of God so powerful. You know, I'd never felt it like that before. So the next day I was coming back and I said, Holy Spirit, what is it that makes the anointing so powerful in this room with a silver carpet? And the Holy Spirit said this. He said, I've deposited an angel in this room that's been waiting for 80 years for these rooms to reopen so that once again I can pour out the anointing to bring healing once again to the city of Spokane. So the same angel that was there for John G. Lake is also there. And you told me sometimes when you travel, for instance, you were recently in Brunswick, Georgia, and yes. what did the maid from the hotel tell you? Well, I'd, I went back to the hotel and went to put my key in the door and I hear a voice down the hallway that says, Reverend, your room is ready. And I looked down the hallway and there was two cleaning ladies standing there. And I looked down and I said, well, how did you know I was a pastor? And the lady looked at me and said, well, this morning when I saw you leave, I told my friend here, I said, that's a preacher. And my friend said, well, how do you know this? She said, because when he left this morning, I saw the angel go with him. Hmm. Now, Michelle, you were touched by God when your husband was touched by God mm -hmm. at this Bethel Church yes. in Redding, California. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and you went along with your husband mm -hmm. out of obedience, but you really weren't with him, were you? Well, I, no. I did, I had my things that I didn't want to give up. You know, you think you, um, you, if you follow God, you have to give up a lot. And so, and I, I liked my TV and I liked going to the movies and I didn't want to give all that up. And so I let him do his thing, 
but I came, it came to a point where I knew that, uh, that I had to make a choice. And once I made that choice, when I made that choice to go with Calvin into the healing rooms and be a part of the ministry, I didn't give up anything. I just, the desire was not there anymore. It, that's what, um, what people need to understand, that you don't give up. You don't have to worry about giving up things in the world. You think, you're, oh, I'm going to have to give this up or that. It's not that. It's when you turn your life over to God and really say, I am going to seek you and walk with you, that you just don't have those desires. A prophet prayed over you yes. right after you had made that decision, yes. knowing nothing about it. And no. what did he say? It was Jim Gall, and he came into the healing rooms, and I could see he was looking at me, and I thought, oh, he's going to read my mail, and maybe some I haven't even read yet. <laughs> and um, so I was kind of worried, but he started to prophesy over me, and he said that I was like a, a flu, and um, the damper was closed, and it was just all clogged. And when he said that, I knew in my spirit that that was what was wrong. And he says, about six weeks ago, you opened the flu. And Cal and I talked about it. It was about six weeks earlier. I had made that choice to quit my job and to go into the healing rooms. And so I, and that was, and it was opening up. It was that simple? You made was, a decision. I made that decision that, you know, I, there's nothing I could dispute with what Calvin was doing. It was God. I would be arguing against God. And so I, I knew that if I didn't walk with him, that our lives would be just going totally different directions. And I didn't want that. I love my husband. And I love the Lord. You know, a decision, so I, mm -hmm. a decision. That's what she made, a decision, a decision to follow God. You're not watching this by accident. That's all he's waiting for. We'll be right back after this. I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. Let's find out who's on next week. Let's go to Janie in the control room. Janie? Sid, you'll be interviewing a man by the name of Randy Clark, and everywhere where this man goes, he sees major healing. I mean, he has seen tumors disappear before his eyes. He has seen the deaf hear, the blind see, and even creative miracles. He'll be talking about a woman who had Parkinson's disease, and 84% of her brain cells were gone, and he prayed for her, and they grew back, and she was healed. Well, I'm looking forward to that, but I'm with Cal and uh, Michelle Pierce, and Cal, you were telling me that you've seen in this uh, silver room where that same angel is, so many miracles. People are coming from all over, but let's yes. get specific. Yes. Tell me about that one person that was mentally ill that yes. got healed. Yes, Joe Oak has, uh, mother brought Joe in uh, with, a, with his best friend. The mother was taking Joe because he had a mental breakdown that was so severe that uh, Joe, a young man in his early 20s, did not know his name, did not know who his mother was, could no longer walk on his own. Mm. She was in the process of taking him to be admitted into the state mental institution, called his best friend to come and help her get Joe in. And best friend said, I heard about these healing rooms. Would, would you mind stopping by there on the way? And the mother said, it was like I was taking my son to his funeral, and it was so traumatic. She said, out of a mother's desperation, I said yes. So they brought Joe in, and the ministry team prayed over Joe in one of the healing rooms. And she, the mother saw such a dramatic change that she took Joe home, and they brought him two more times. And just the other day, the elevator opened and out stepped Joe. And he reached out and he took my hand. He says, remember me? I'm Joe. And Joe was absolutely normal. And that's why we're there. That's right. Tell me about some other specific people that were healed. Well, we had uh, Brian Wilkes. Brian has come in a number of times for prayer. He'd had brain surgery, chemotherapy. The doctors were had done everything they could do. Cancer? with brain cancer and uh, Brian uh, uh, emailed us the other day and said uh, he said I went to the doctor and I was tested again and my the tumor that I had is shrunk down to less than the size of a marble but he said the, the mir miraculous thing it went from cancerous to benign and the doctor said Brian you're going to be around a long time 
when you see things like that, it's it's worth everything mm -hmm. you two oh. have gone through. Yes. I'll tell you, our, you know, the, the sick are worth it. They're worth our lives. Now, there are people that are watching us right now that have been given a death sentence by their doctors. Uh, you've been told you have six months to live, three months to live. Do they need to accept that death sentence? Oh, not at all. Not at all. You two seem pretty yeah. strong on that. Je Jesus is our yeah. savior. He's our healer. He's not going to commission us to get us saved, commission us to go into all the world to preach the gospel and leave us flat on our backs so we can't do it. It's his great love that uh, pours forth healing. It's his heart. It's in the atonement. He is our healer. And he just wants to show the church that, that healing needs to be the norm in the church, not the exception. Now, what about someone blind? It, well, we had a young lady who was diagnosed in December, Carolyn Nera, legally blind this last December, and she came in about a little over a month ago with a big grin on her face because she had come in time and time again, and Carolyn said, I just came from the eye doctor, and my eyes are 20-20. And he's, Is that possible? He, the doctor had been in practice for over 10 years, and he said, Carolyn, you had a degenerative eye disease that is not reversible. He says, I don't know what happened, Carolyn, but your eyes are 20-20. And Carolyn come in the other day, she told us, she says, you can stop praying now because my eyes are 20-15 now. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Well, I'll tell you what, how about praying for me? No, I'm yes, just sir. teasing. I'm serious. Oh. But I'll tell you what, there are people watching us right now that are yes. desperate. Is yes. that, let me ask you something. Is that same angel that's in the healing room here in the studio right now, do you know? Oh, the presence of the Holy Spirit is here, brother. He wants to heal the sick. Would, would you pray specifically for people right yes, now? Yes, I will. Amen. Yes. You know, no matter who you are, no matter where you're at, just know that Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He gave his life. He bore your sickness. He carried your pain. He wants you to know by his stripes you were healed. And no matter how tough it might seem to you, it's his great love that heals the sick. And he wants to heal you today. All you've got to do is ask him. He says you have not because you ask not. But his great love is to heal his people. And he'll do it. We would just say, Father, in Jesus' name, for those who are hurting out there, put your hand upon them, Lord. Bring healing into their bodies right now, Father. They're, your hand is not short. It doesn't matter where they're at. That You can heal them right where they are right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I can tell you that I sense, I mean, I can, I can feel the presence yes. of God right now. Yes. And some of you cannot feel it, and some of you can. But that's not what's so important. What is important is for you to know God. You see, this life is just a blink of the eye. Yes. But there's more. Amen. There is so much more for you right now. If you will pray to know God right at this moment, God is going to become real to you. Pray out loud, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. With your help, I turn from my sins. I believe that you died for my sins. And by your blood, I am clean. And now that I am clean, I ask you, Jesus, to come inside of me, take over my life. I make you Lord of my life. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, and meant it. God meant what he said. Some of you can, this is what is known as interactive television. Some of you literally, I mean, I can feel, it, it, the best way I can describe it is what Jesus said. He said that you will have rivers of living water flowing continuously, rivers flowing continuously. And I pray that that river that is going right through the television set right now would go right into you and that you would experience what Cal and Michelle experienced. I pray for reality. I pray for shalom, great peace, great completeness for you. I pray for peace like you've never experienced before. That's God. 
That is God right now, and that is His river of His Spirit right on you.